Thank you so much uh, for joining us at TD. I'm Ronald Olepian from TD Bank. Um, it's, uh, I was saying everybody keeps thanking us for, for, for hosting, and I just want to thank you for allowing us to host, because I think that these, these events are, are, uh, are really important for us. Um, before, I pass, before I pass the mic, just two, two quick thoughts. Um, those of us in our profession, um, in communications, which is the function that I, that I manage, obviously deal with the media on an ongoing basis, and we have conversations, and we, and, and we, and we work, and we, build, and we build relationships. But when I think back to you know, the, the industry and the profession 20 years ago when I started in, in, in this business, five years ago, five weeks ago, five days ago, the, the evolution has actually been quite dramatic and quite significant. But what's remained important and why I think today's panel is so interesting and so, and so relevant, but what has remained important is despite the ups and downs of the profession or of the industry of the financial situation in the marketplace, democracy actually does stand on the shoulders of journalism. Um, the, the ability to bring an issue like indigenous rights to the forefront of the national agenda such that the prime minister uses his time at the United Nations General Assembly to speak about it, to, to bring up issues of people that may not have the protection of the state in the right way and bring them to the forefront to hold our politicians honest, and I won't mention any names in terms of what they say, and to deal with the fact that I, I actually found a word, we keep talking about fake news, I saw a report the other day that called it weaponized news, which is actually what I think what we're seeing in the, in the market, and, and the role that media has to investigate that, to curate it, to present the facts into the marketplace so they become as part of the dialogue. Um, that role hasn't actually changed, and I would argue is even more important than it was when this profession started. And, and it really does hold up um, everyone to be accountable, and accountability is, at the end of the day, the foundation of what we, of, of what we all aspire to, to live, to live in, a, in, a, in a democratic society. So that's all I wanted to say, which is why I think this panel is, is so important. And with that, I want to uh, welcome um, Kathy English up to, the, uh, up to the podium. We only met a little while ago for the first time, but I must say, under the guise of certain clients in my past, I may have written to her in the past <laughs> as, <laughs> as a public editor of the, uh, of, of the Toronto Star, which at the end of the day is, is part of that process of holding us all accountable to, to, to the truth, uh, which, is what, which is what the profession is all about. Which, which all of us need to be all about living in a democracy. So welcome, and please welcome to the podium. Thanks, Ron. Um, welcome, everyone, to tonight's Jay Talk on the stories behind the stories that matter. I am always really, really delighted when we, it, our Jay Talks get to the focus on real journalism, and especially tonight when we shine a light on some of the most important journalism done in this country, by three of the most amazing, outstanding female journalists on the eve of International Women's Day. Um, certainly the highest calling in journalism is to do work that makes a difference, and uh, these three undoubtedly have done that. And I think that what you'll see through this um, the session is that their work is really driven by grit and passion and caring and because they know they're working on stories that matter. So my thanks to TD for this amazing venue. Uh, Ron, we're just really delighted to be here and really delighted by the partnership with TD and uh, it, it's been great. So, you know it's a really, really special event when Matt Galloway comes out at night. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. We're really, we're so delighted to have you here. Um, I would think that Matt needs no introduction, but we're going to uh, introduce him anyway. Uh, Matt is the host of Metro Morning on CBC Radio 1. Uh, that's the top rated uh, Metro or morning radio program in Toronto. Also co-host of Podcast Playlist, also on CBC. Matt's been at CBC for more than 10 years. Um, for four consecutive years, he was voted top radio personality in Toronto by readers and editors of Now Magazine, named a Toronto hero um, by Torontoists, and this is the one I like, Mensch of the Year by <laughs> Grid Magazine. <laughs> Um, in 2012, Matt was given the Excellence in Community Service Award for addressing issues confronting diverse communities by the Intercul Intercultural Dialogue Institute. And in 2013, he received the Award for Diversity and Social Inclusion by the Tagore Anniversary Celebrations Committees. Um, Matt has been um, 
twice voted, or three times, sorry, uh, one of Toronto's uh, 50 most influential people by Toronto Life, and he's received the African Canadian Achievement Award for Excellence in Media. And I know if you're a regular listener of Matt every morning, you know that these issues matter to him, and uh, we can't think of anyone better to moderate tonight's session. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, it's only special that I'm here because it's late and I should probably be getting ready to go to bed soon. Um, I'm delighted to be here because I'm a big fan of the work of these three women. They do extraordinary uh, things and um, tell stories that uh, we all need to be thinking about and stories that uh, we are richer for having learned. And it's going to be fun over the next hour or so to talk to them a bit about um, telling these stories, about getting the stories right. Um, about why these stories matter and about what these stories in the best case scenario can do. We'll chat, as I mentioned, for about an hour or so. There's a microphone in the middle, and so towards the end of it, we uh, will take some of your questions. I always say during these sorts of things that um, questions are key, that uh, um, if you have a question, a specific question uh, for one of the guests, that would be ideal. Um, and I'll, if you're kind of you know, making a statement or something like that, um, we'll drive you to the question because that's what we like to do. Um, you know the work of these three women, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce them. Robin Doolittle, uh, investigative journalist with The Globe and Mail, her extraordinary series into how Canadian police services handle sexual assault is called Unfounded. Tanya Talaga is a journalist at the Toronto Star last week. Her book, Seven Fallen Feathers, which is fantastic, won the RBC Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction. Connie Walker, investigative journalist and host of CBC News' Missing and Murdered podcast, a brand new season of said podcast debuts tomorrow. She is Cree from the Okanese First Nation in Saskatchewan. Please welcome our amazing panel. Um, when you pitched the stories that um, you have been telling for the last little while. What was the pitch that you made to the people who would give the green light or the red light? The folks who would say, yay, this is a great idea and we want you to invest your time in it or maybe think about something else. Robin. Oh, geez. You know what? I could say I could probably be better at my elevator pitch on stories, but uh, you know the great thing and sometimes the hard thing about the Globe is they trust you so much that they actually are like, "What do you want to do?" And you'll start to tell them, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, go do that." And like, we'll talk to you when you are further along in the process. Um, so, Unfounded started like when I started doing my Unfounded series. I, I didn't initially envision what it would become. It was purely almost like a fishing exercise. Like I read this study, I thought it was interesting, uh, the study about unfounded rates, so really quickly, police, when they do an investigation, at the end of that investigation, they give it a code, and one of those codes means, I don't think this crime occurred. Uh, I don't think this crime oc occurred is not the same thing as, we didn't have enough evidence to lay a charge, or we couldn't figure out the suspect, this, is, this didn't happen. Um, and I saw a little study about seven police services, and I was wondering what it would look like across the country. So I kind of filed all these FOIs, and then I continued with the hospital investigation, and it wasn't until we got you know, 50 of them back or so, and was kind of looking at this, that I went to the boss people, as I call them. And uh, I was ready to, I was like, okay, let's write this, and they're like, OK, this is really interesting. Actually, can we do the entire country? Can we do all 1,100 police jurisdictions? And that's how that conversation went. Amazing. Tanya? Oh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, yeah. Tanya. Um, my story is kind of long, and I will try not to, uh, <laughs> to take up like all the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I pitched another story, um, actually. Uh, it was in 2011. This is a journey that sort of started uh, the newspaper articles that I wrote and also the book. Um, I pitched an article uh, to do a series of articles on Indigenous voting patterns, really. Um, it was 2011. I was a political reporter at Queen's Park. And if you are in politics and you're writing, you know, you want to be in the game. You want to write that federal election story. And I was like the low person on the, uh, on the pile. There was no way I was going to be able to join the election team unless I came up with my own ideas. And one of them was, you know, why is it said Indigenous people um, in the North, why don't they vote? I, of course, knew the answers why. Um, I knew that status Indians in this country didn't get the vote until 1960. And I knew the other historic reasons. Um, but my editor 
first sat the star, I thought, wow, that's, that's a different, interesting idea. And this was before um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This was before I Don't Know More. This was, I think, even before CBC Indigenous or APTN was really on everybody's national radar. And so um, I went to Thunder Bay to do that story. And the reason why I went there was because that's where my mother is from. And I knew I could speak to Stan Berity, who was then the Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation which is a political organization of 49 Northern First Nations. It's a massive territory about the, um, it's Treaty 3, um, about the size of the country of France. So I went to talk to Stan, and um, as I was asking Stan, you know, why is it that, I uh, threw a, you know, just a general question right out from the front, um, why is it that Indigenous people in this area aren't voting? And he looked at me and he said, why aren't you writing a story about Jordan Labas? And I thought he didn't hear me. <laughs> I'm like, what? Maybe I just said something different. And so I asked it again, and he said the same thing. And we went on like that for about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Um, I would ask a question about voting patterns. I'm like, you know, but if, if people in all of these First Nations went this way, you could swing the vote in this riding. And he's looking at me, and he said, you know, Jordan's been missing for 70 days. So I had to put my manic Toronto journalist self aside because I knew that I was not going to get the answers I was looking for. I had to, to sort of stop what I was doing, remember who I was and where I was, and a grand chief was trying to tell me something that was really important. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think that that's when I sort of opened my ears and I listened to him, and that's when he told me that it's actually been, um, Jordan was the seventh student to die or to go missing. And at that point, he was missing. Um, it's a longer story, but uh, he's, his body would be found within two months. We'll come back to that in a moment as well. Connie, for you? Um, I, I think the, the interesting part about my pitch is the one I made 10 years ago when um, a girl that I knew from back home, I'm from a small reserve in Saskatchewan, and a girl I knew from back home had gone missing. And I heard about it through an email chain. Like her family was sending out email chains. It was like 2005, 2006. It was you know a long time ago. Um, and it was the same summer that Alicia Ross went missing in downtown Toronto. And I don't know how many of you remember her, but she was blonde and beautiful. And um, you know she was on the cover of the national newspapers and on the national newscast at night. And Amber, who was missing in Saskatchewan, didn't even get any local news coverage. And you know I. Remember thinking about the similarities between them. They were both young women who were beautiful, who had their futures ahead of them, and families that loved them and missed them and wanted to know what happened. And I pitched that story. Um, and my boss at the time said, she stopped me as I was pitching and said, This isn't another poor Indian story, is it? And that was, you know, really obviously crushing and, and, ter and I didn't get to do that story um, about Amber. But fast forward 10, 11, 12 years now, I've spent the last five years of my career focusing on Indigenous issues and the last solid three years working on this issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. So now it's the same way where there is an obvious appetite, there's a recognition of the importance of these stories. And so, um, you know, I'm in a position where it's it's great if I say I have a great story, then you know it's it's going to be greenlit. But I think that we really have to understand where we've come from to to get to this point. What was it like to be told um, or to be asked this isn't another oh poor Indian story? I honestly don't even remember. Like I feel like I was like punched in the gut or something. And and your reaction in that that moment is just to be like normalize the situation or like la I don't even I don't even know what I said. Like I must have laughed it off. But I left. I remember feeling so emotional. Like I didn't want to cry in the office, so I left. Um, but it's so deflating. But I don't think at the time it was surprising. Like I have, I've worked at CBC now for 17 years, and I have always been interested in telling stories from our communities. They've always been important stories, um, and it's only been in the last five years that there has really been this growing appetite to hear them. Um, and so I felt like back then it was kind of like, oh, that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, there, that was kind of par for the course, mm -hmm. I think, for a long time. What do you think, and uh, we'll come back to Tanya in a moment, because she has this, a story mm -hmm. that's kind of similar in that, but what, what, what did you, what do you think has changed? Um, well, I think digital, well, I think digital has really shifted the focus. Um, I think that, you know, it used to be we had, you know, largely white, 
journalists in Toronto making decisions about what was important on the national agenda. And there were people who would decide what was going to be on the national newscast or on the front page. Um, and now we have metrics that actually show us what Canadians are interested in. And we have, like, you know, we can point to the social media uh, shares on a particular story. And, and I think that's what's really fueled this, this desire that there's finally, you know, we're making the decisions in, in terms of. Uh, what's popular on social media. And I think, I mean, Idle No More was obviously huge, uh, but that also, I think, happened because of social media, because of connectivity and, and people uh, having a space online. And, and also, I mean, you know, you, you don't have to go as far to actually talk to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an Indigenous person mm. in the same way. You had to go back to your editors in Toronto and tell them that you had a different story. That's right. I still haven't filed that election story. <laughs> the election story, you, you, Kathy. You could. You should. It's still owing. I know. It's still the election is still coming, know, but it's still owing. It's going to be a bit dated. Outstanding. Yeah. A little bit dated. Um, yeah. It's actually maybe more relevant considering the last election. <laughs> That's true. That's true. When you came back with the other story, yes. What were you? Did you think that they would bite? Do you think that? I, mean, I remember reading um, that that. There was some concern as to whether this would be, you know, oh, yeah. just that, a Thunder Bay story or that whether was, it would be yeah, a Toronto story. Because or... I remember when Stan was telling me this, like my in my head, I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be able to sell to my editors in Toronto that a 15 year old Indigenous boy from Webakwe First Nation has gone missing. You know, they're they're not going to print that story. I just I just knew it, um, and it was it was interesting. I think that um, that it all. Um, it, it's it's not easy, right? It's not easy to do this this kind of work, um, but it uh, I don't know. Um, what do you think convinced them? What do I think convinced them? Sold them on the story? You know what? Um, I think that my editor. I had a female editor at the time, and uh, she was into it. She was she was young. Um, her name was uh, Jane Davenport, and she said, "Yes, let's go for it." You know, it's it's a good story. And we blared the story on the front page. We had um, pictures of uh, two of the kids at the time. Um, I had been dropped off at the school by Stan, because um, that was a continuation of our day. He actually put me in his pickup truck, and we went to, <laughs> yeah, we went to the river to, to look at where Jordan was last seen. And then we also went to the school. Um, where uh, six of the seven were students. Mm -hmm. And um, in typical Stan fashion, he just sort of waltzed me into the school. We went to the, up to the principal's office, and he just like banged on the desk, and he goes, this is Tanya. She's Nish. Let her in. Tell her everything. <laughs> and so that's what happened. Um, and we, to the star's credit, had the story on the very front page. Um, and I tried to keep it going. You know, I was at Queen's Park, so I was able to sort of run after those um, politicians, as they were coming under the legislature, um, I would go after the attorney general. I would go after anybody, the premier, and say, you know, why is it that um, that there's no inquest into the deaths of these kids? You know, do you know what's going on in Thunder Bay? And I asked those questions, and I would file those stories, and I filed like a, a, quite a few of them. And the Star, to its credit, you know, played them. But then I also had blowback too. It's like, you know, I did have one editor saying, you know, get her. Get her off those stories. Do something different, and so. But that was again early on, right? I mean, like there wasn't the appetite that we are seeing now whatsoever, and it's been a great thing to see, a really great thing to see, because I think it is digital. Mm. I think it is Idle No More and um, the TRC, and it's also the young people. Now I sound like I'm a thousand years old. <laughs> it's the young people out there. Um, but it's true. It's the youth in our communities. It's the youth across the country, really, that are the ones that are saying, hey, you know what? It's not OK. It's not OK that we didn't know about residential schools. It's not OK that you know there's um, this underlying sort of bit of racism that runs through Canadian society of like looking the other way when it comes to Indigenous issues. And so people are challenging that, and it's the youth that are doing it. So why do you think, you had a very different experience, Robin, in, in pitching something that this is what I'm interested in, actually, no, this is what you could do. Yeah. Um, why do you think you were, you were presented with that broader opportunity? Yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, to the Globe's credit, that was, uh, 
just the absolute right decision to make in that time. Um, I think at that point I was still pretty new to, I'd spent most of my, my entire career as a beat reporter. So you're filing, like covering cops, covering city hall, you're, you're filing three, four, five, six, seven stories a week sometimes. So getting used to not writing for months and months and months at a time can can be the worst feeling ever when you are a writer. And so I'd already you know, felt like I'd spent so much time on this story, so I was still, maybe I couldn't see the big picture. Um, but my editors did see the big picture. And the, uh, so that first batch of freedom of information requests that we got back showed that police were uh, dismissing, in some communities, uh, up to you know 30% of sexual assault uh, accusations as unfounded, meaning 30% were just being kind of said, this is not an actual sexual assault complaint, so we won't count this as even an allegation. And the discussion that we had was, if you're going to do this story, you, you obviously know you're going to get blowback when you go after law enforcement, and especially when you touch the sexual assault issue. We all know that there's a problem with how the justice system handles these cases. Um, so how can you actually move the needle on it? And their argument was, the only way to do that is to do everything, to do the entire country, to be black and white, that you can't, you can't argue with this number. And, um, and, and there was, yeah, it's, such a, it's a really powerful model to me for, for journalism going forward. And I, I think that it's something that I will try to, to do going on in my career. Mm. Um, but yeah, to, to think, I don't know if this is exactly your, your, the answer to your question, it's definitely not actually. But um, what I say <laughs> to like young journalists now is uh, when I, talk to them it's yeah like think think big now that we have you know digital media social media you can reach any corner of this country um, absolutely go big or go home that's how you convince readers to pay for it and I think that uh, our boss people understand that 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 is it's um, you know it's a privilege to to work at a place that's going to to put out this this information and it's also readers want it so they're willing to pay for it um when you got the green light, what was the biggest challenge in telling these stories in a way that, that um, would do, I mean, you talk about a privilege, it's a privilege to tell the stories as well. What oh, was the, the biggest challenge in telling the stories? I mean, space, like that was the big thing. So I'd already been doing this for so long, eight months, and then we went back to do the whole country. So another round of FOIs, and I knew, and if you know anything about freedom of information requests in this country, you know it's gonna take a long time. So while I was waiting for that data to come back, um, you know, I, I was kind of sitting down, like, where are the holes in my story? Like, what can I do to make this better? And the thing that was really missing was the human element. Uh, I have stats, I have numbers, I have black and white data, but I don't have something that's going to actually reach out and grab you and go, like, look, this is a person, and this is what happened to her, and this could have been you, and this maybe was you, and this was your daughter or your son or whatever. And so I, while sending out all these FOIs, went around and I emailed uh, or wrote a letter to every rape crisis center in the country and made a pitch that you should, because journalists are always contacting rape crisis centers and saying, can you connect me with someone who was raped? And for obvious reasons, they're not, I know it's disgusting, but we do have to do it sometimes. Anyway, um, I made a pitch that this was something serious and I was gonna stick with this and this wasn't gonna just be a drive-by news story and was often interviewed by the executive directors and some places just went guns a blazing. They're like, okay, this is our chance. And they were just like connecting me and vouching for me with all these people. And I ended up interviewing I think something like 55 wow. uh, individuals who had um, uh, reported being sexually assaulted to police. And that was a thing, is I wanted only people who, were, who had reported it to police, because what I was looking at specifically was what the interaction with police was like. I was not trying to prove whether they were sexually assaulted or not. Um, and so then I come back to the Globe with, okay, I have all this data, it's all in, and I have these great stories that'll make great characters in my stories, but I also have like, dozens and dozens of stories that I've investigated because I was getting police reports from mm. these people. And um, I was like, I, I feel like these people have bared their soul to us and it just seems such a shame that we can't include them all. And they said, okay, let's publish all of them. Everyone who wants them in. So we ran a story every day in the paper um, for I think 36 days. 36 people were okay with having them published. But uh, that's the, also the beauty of the internet is there's unlimited space, so we just kind of threw it all online. So that was the hardest part is, how do you fit, I think the whole project yeah. was something like 60,000 words. Wow. Like by the start to finish, all the different pieces. That's a book. Yeah. It's a book. I know, right? Right, I should just like, 
move that over there. <laughs> Easier said yeah, than Yeah, exactly. Um, you just said something really interesting, which is that some of these people were OK with having their stories published. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a bit about telling people stories and trust? Um, how do you go about, uh, and we'll start with you, Connie, how do you go about earning trust? Especially if people feel burned, um, they feel like their stories are dismissed, they feel like, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to that phrase. It's just another Indian story. Mm -hmm. How do you go about telling people, convincing people, that you care about their story, that their story matters, um, and that the story is going to be treated in, in you know, commensurate with, with, with how it should be in terms of sensitivity and accuracy and voice? And Especially within Indigenous communities, there is just an inherent mistrust of the media. Because for so many years or decades or forever, our stories have been you know, underrepresented, just not told, like MMIW for so long, or misrepresented, you know, just people who come in don't have the right context to understand how it's connected to something else. And so um, I absolutely recognize that that is, that is a huge issue in so many communities. I think, I, I have to think that because I'm a Cree woman who grew up on a reserve, um, who, you know, I have so many uh, personal connections to the issues that I'm reporting on and that I have an understanding and a sensitivity that I didn't have to learn in a classroom necessarily. Um, that is a huge, you know, I'm really lucky that I have that. And so I haven't actually had very many people who have been skeptical about mm. me approaching them, to be honest. Like, I've been really lucky. But it, it's, I'm also incredibly careful. Uh, I feel like I almost approach it the opposite way of probably any normal journalist, where I'm like, if you want to talk to me, like, totally fine. Totally fine. If you don't want to talk, I'm okay with that, too. Like, it's totally up to you. No pressure at all. Like, whatever you're comfortable with. Why would you say that? I mean, knowing what to say. Because <clears throat> somebody could say no, and that what you know is a great story. Just yeah, I think it's because I also know how difficult it is, especially like because I'm, I've been focused on indigenous issues and uh, often like missing and murdered indigenous women uh, in particular, or child welfare, or you know issues that are very traumatic. And so I think the thing the thing that's important for journalists to understand when you're approaching these kinds of stories is that if you're going to talk to somebody about their loved one who is missing or has been murdered. You know, that is probably not the only incredibly traumatic thing that family has been through. So this is like layers upon layers upon layers of trauma that you're dealing with. And even though families, you know, I've found, you know, they're, they're grateful for their, for their interest in their stories. And I've never had anyone say, no, I'm, I don't want. And I feel like I'm like, are you sure? I know this can be really difficult and you know, no pressure. And you know, Claudia, we did a number of interviews with her for the last podcast. And her sister, Alberta, went missing in 1989. Um, and this was the first time anyone had ever asked for her story and for, uh, for Albert to tell Alberta's story or to help tell Alberta's story. I was going to say, where do you think that comes from? That that gratitude, but it comes from the fact that people actually, that you're actually yeah. interested. I remember somebody entering me and saying, you know, you're telling her story after all, or, you know, something about that. And I remember that I was like, I don't think that she just hasn't been telling it for 27 years. I don't think anyone's ever asked her. And so she's just so grateful that, you know, she, this is still so important for her. She wants justice for her sister. She's willing to do anything to get it. And so I, I think that I've been, like lucky in that I, I have a, a bit of an understanding, but also I think I'm very careful with people and try to be very sensitive to what I know is, uh, you know, more than one particular issue that they're dealing with. Tanya, how yeah. did you go about earning trust? Well, you, I'm going to steal this line from Duncan McHugh because uh, he's said it before. You can't be a story taker. You know, it, I don't think it's good journalism anywhere to just to sort of go in, sort of. You know, I want these questions answered. This is what I'm looking for. Um, my conversation with Stan is a perfect example of that. You know, you, that's just not a good way to approach anybody. And also, too, when you're dealing with all of these things that um, we're all dealing with, I mean, they're they're hard things. And oftentimes, too, as you said so well, like the families have dealt with so many other things too. So, how do you avoid being the story taker. What did you say when you went up that you had to kind of well, you arc your, your, your impatient Toronto yeah, kind of yeah, self? Exactly. Like, this yeah. is the story and yeah. I need it now. You develop relationships with people. I think that's an important mm -hmm. thing to do. I mean, like, you know, you have to show that there's a measure of trust um, and um, that you understand where they're coming from and you understand, you can't understand all their pain, but you can understand, you know, some of it. And um, 
I think that having a background in that, you know, it, I don't want to say it helps, but it, you have a different empathy when you're, um, when you're dealing with someone else's trauma and pain. Um, and I feel that you really do must have those relationships with the people you're writing with, especially if you're doing longer term reporting like the podcasts that you do, you know, the work that you do as well. You, you have to have a relationship with people you don't want to, you don't want to screw them. You know, you don't want them to read something and then just fall apart um, or cause other trauma. Um, in our case, uh, for the book, um, we decided to show the chapters to the family members that we, we talked to. And you never do that in journalism. I was going to say, again, that's a right, risk. Right, exactly. Like, if I was to say, you know, to tell Michael Cook, oh, yeah, I just checked that story. <laughs> the person I wrote, like, he's like, he would freak. Explosion. You know? <laughs> yeah. did, they, did they want anything changed? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm glad I did, you know? And it, it was important to do that. Was um, that, I mean, when they said, we want something changed, I mean, how did you react? Because, again, you have a sense as to how the story right. could be told, would be told. Yeah. You, have yeah. some sort of ownership, right. but you've turned it over to them. Are you, you, are you fine? I didn't have an ownership, though. This was their story, right? And this was a community story. And um, I often say, too, and it's going to sound kind of crazy, but I, I think many hands wrote the book. Like, it wasn't just me. It was like all of these voices came together to, to do this book. And so by showing it to um, the people that I was writing about, I think that that was part of it, too. I mean, um, I could tell you stories, my goodness. Um, one mom, I would always call her, and she'd always be on the other end of the phone, and I'd go over what I was writing. I'm like, is this right? Is this right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's how the conversation would go. It would be me talking and her, mm-hmm, 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 and saying nothing till the very end. <laughs> and then um, I remember when the chapter was all done, and she just said, just send it to me. And so I did. <laughs> and um, she called me up, and she goes, hi, you've made three mistakes. <laughs> and then we went one, two, three, and we went, and I changed it, and I was very grateful that she she did that, and then she said thank you, mm. um, and that to me was was a lot because you know this is this is the death and disappearance of their of their children. Um, in another case, it was like it was it was a bit harder. One of the moms was like, you know, you got this whole thing wrong, and I was like, <gasps> what? We did what? Mm -hmm. You know, and this is just before the book was about to go into advanced reading uh, copies, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know. And so I, I remember calling and Nancy saying, okay, we have to like work this this um, little bit. We have to figure out what we're going to do here. And that was important for you. I mean, it yeah. sounds obvious, but that was important for you because mm -hmm. because why? Well, it's. It's not my story to tell. Like, you know, it's um, I'm telling their stories. And this is also, too, a way to honor their kids. I mean, the, the whole book was meant to do that, to show that these kids were loved by their families, you know, by their communities, um, and that we can do better for them. This entire country can do better for them. And so it was important for me that they had something that they weren't going to hate. You know? When did you know, Robin, that you had the trust of people whose stories you wanted to tell? Again, the stats are one thing, but it's the stories that, that, that humanize um, the series. When did you know that as, on a subject as difficult as sexual assault that, that you had the trust? I probably, I don't know many journalists that do this, and I probably break all sorts of rules, but I... Um, yeah, this is the way I think we should all operate now. It, it just, especially now... Um, when we really need to earn the public's trust, um, this is the kind of my rules of engagement. When I speak to somebody, not a politician or someone who's trying to spin me, I'm talking like regular people who are, don't have PR people to protect them. Um, first conversation is always off record, like legit off record. We're just having a conversation and I want to introduce myself to you. And this is what I'm doing and this is why I want to talk to you and this is how this would work. And to lay out the rules of engagement. Um, and with the uh, primarily women, there's a couple men, but primarily women, so I'll say women. With the women that I interviewed for Unfounded, uh, my rules were um, you can uh, withdraw from the story at any point up until the last week, uh, like because by that point it will be out of my hands. Um, if you, if, we will do a fact check, like a full fact check of the story before it runs. And I do this with almost every story I write. People that I interview, I go through the story with them. I say, I'm going to start out this way. I don't read them the story, but like this is kind of how it starts. I go into talking from this person. I do a quote that kind of says this. 
then I introduce you, <clears throat> this is what I have you saying, and with their section, I'm much more detailed in what it is. Um, so I said, I'm gonna go through the story with you, you're gonna know exactly what's being printed, um, and if you don't like something, we're gonna talk about it. I uh, maintain the ability, like there are, and there actually was one case where I was fact checking, it was the last situation, it was a week before the series was running, I was going through the story with a girl, and she did not want a specific detail in about what happened with her. And I was like, I totally understand. I have to put that detail in because to not put it in is changing the whole story. It was around that she was staying with the guy, um, that it was his apartment. It was crucial because of the way the court case unfolded anyway. She just did not want it in. And I was like, well, then we're just gonna pull the story. Like, that's the only way to do it. So, um, Did you pull the story? And we did pull the story. And because uh, it was the fair thing to do. She didn't want it in, and I needed it in to be fair, and that's what is happening. But so. again, you said that it breaks all the rules. I mean, that the, the stereotypical journalist thing would be to say, this is a great story, and we need the story in, and you've told us a story in things. Yeah, I remember, I remember being in journalism school, and I remember hearing, you know, certainly in my earlier days uh, in my reporting career and speaking with, with some... Uh, more senior, mainly men, I'm gonna say, uh, journalists about their opinions on how it goes, and there's, no, you tell me your story and I'm in charge, and I don't care, I don't, and like, my worst nightmare is someone opening the paper and reading what I've written, and them feeling upset about it. And, and so often, when, when that, because that has happened to me, and it's so often because it was just some innocuous little thing that I didn't think was a thing and didn't even, could possibly think it was a thing, but it was a thing to them. Um, and if I just had had a conversation to them about what I wanted to write, we would have caught it, and it wouldn't have changed anything. And I think that that is different now. And I remember being in journalism school and saying, like, you don't read quotes back to people. And yeah, I'm not going to read quotes back to Kathleen Wynne, but like, <laughs> you know, poor, like, like, like this normal person who does not understand what, it, yeah, it's right. I'm, babbling here, one more thing I'll babble about. Another thing I did that was probably, you know. okay, breaking the rules was um, uh, the, uh, a lot of the women that I uh, interviewed, especially younger ones, were like, name me, put my name in the paper, like, this is my time. And uh, yeah, this is also breaking the rules, but I said, okay, let's talk about that. You are 21 years old, you're still in university, you don't know what you wanna do with the rest of your life. This is going to be on the Globe and Mail. This is going to be the main Google hit on your name for the rest of your life, likely. Like, in the top. It's going to be on the main page. Do you want to have your name attached to this? And it's fine if you do, and it's great if you do, and you have nothing to be ashamed about, and you've done nothing wrong, and it should be fine, but I want you to think about it. And there were some of them that, that changed their mind. A lot of them did, actually. But it's important to talk through that with, with people and talk through, um, like, a lot of them, for example. OK, so you're anonymous. Like a lot of the, again, a lot of the women I interviewed were mm. really young. So you're anonymous. Yes, they don't have their name in the paper. Okay. Um, don't, some of them like as the stories were coming out would like tweet at me. And I'm like, you can't tweet at me because someone, if they want to find out who you are, is going to go through my mentions. We'll track it back. And, and, and a couple of them did. They, and, and so, like, but having I mean, other journalists got, got, like, And another there. journalist, so um, Ava Williams, she's the main character in the first story. She was anonymous at first. She was just Ava. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's since uh, uh, come forward and is launching a lawsuit, it's very important, yada, yada, but a London radio station found her um, because she'd kind of posted about it on social media, and so, um, which, which was fine, because she was kind of coming forward anyway, like, I, I knew she was going to eventually out herself, but um, I, it was a good lesson to, like, you need to have sit-down conversations with all your sources. Like, let's talk about your social media. Let's talk about um, who you've spoken with in your friends or family. Because there's anonymous to the world, and there's anonymous in your life. And the details that you release in both, in two different venues are, are different, right? So do, I always ask, do you care, when you want to be anonymous, do you want to be anonymous to your best friend? Because your best friend is going to recognize the sweater that you're wearing in this photo. And um, they'd have to think about it. And, and often it's like if uh, we hadn't had that conversation and they saw it in the paper the next day, they mm. might freak out. But if you think about it, no, I'm okay with my best friend knowing. Okay, do you want to warn anybody it's running? 
uh, yeah, maybe I will talk to people and get people, like it, it's just having like real full, it's, I don't wanna say you're partnering because you're not someone's friend and you're not their therapist and you, you are coming from a place of skepticism, skepticism, you're the journalist, but you have to be responsible and part of being responsible is making sure your sources fully understand what they're getting into by telling you their stories. You nodded like vigorously to everything oh. that you said. <laughs> was I, I'm also just very, that's, that's what I do. No, no, but it was really interesting. People. I mean, it's that idea yeah. of like, I mean, it's the responsibility, some yes. degree of ownership, but, I think but that, it's not your story, but at the same time yeah. you have. Oh, I think that it's also the this idea, I think that's why I'm like totally no pressure because I understand what happens once somebody's story is out there. And also just the amount of control that we have, even if we're trying to be as considerate as possible and as responsible as possible, the amount of control we have over how someone is portrayed in the media. And you know that that's, I feel like that's a huge decision that maybe a lot of people aren't quite ready for when they say, yes, I'm ready or I want to do it. Does that nudge you to a line that, um, not over a line, but close to a line about uh, losing the skepticism, the distance from the subject as a journalist, that you end up not advocating for the person that you're talking about or the issue that you're talking about, but you get close to that when, 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 you, when, when you have that investment in it, when you have that responsibility? When I feel responsibility for yeah. people that I'm interviewing? Yeah. And the subject that you're talking about. Um, I don't think so, but maybe, but maybe. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think that I, I definitely have that. Like, I and especially because for the last few years, I've been doing these long form podcasts that are eight or nine or ten episodes. So you end up, you know, I've, the the podcast is coming out tomorrow. We've been working on for a full year with one family, and so um, you know, it's it's you, it is a relationship. Like, you have a relationship with them. I've you know gone through things in the last year alongside her that you know, have been life changing for her. And so I absolutely have this, you know, this, I feel a responsibility that she is, um, she's going to be okay at the, at the end of it. As a Cree woman, do you feel like a, a responsibility absolutely. to tell those stories? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and it's that line between being a journalist and, and being somebody who's invested in the story as well. Yeah, I think that, I think that I wouldn't, I don't know if I would be a journalist if I wasn't, uh, like, I've, I've always been a journalist who's interested in telling these stories because I, I understand the importance of them. And, and I've seen, like, the very first time I became interested in journalism was um, when I was in high school and there was a trial of a woman named Pamela George happening, uh, sorry, two men were charged in her murder. Um, and she was, uh, a Cree woman from the Sacame First Nation, um, and the two men who were charged in her murder were white university students at the University of Regina. And I remember reading about the case in like grade 10 or grade nine or 10, and you know, so much was made of the fact that she was a sex worker and that uh, you know, these guys were university students. And I remember feeling like this was a one-sided account of what was obviously somebody that I, I didn't know Pamela, but I felt like I could have known Pamela or she could have been in my family. So that absolutely motivated me to try to not necessarily advocate for her, but to advocate for the reality of life for indigenous people. Because I think for so long it's been ignored in mainstream media. And even when it's been covered, it, if you don't have the context to understand how or why MMIW is connected to residential schools or is connected to child welfare, you're only telling part of the story. So it's, I feel like it's advocating for the truth more than advocating for, it's not like a partisan position yeah. or, or, or anything, but I, I definitely feel a responsibility, I, I don't actually know, I shouldn't say that, but I definitely feel a responsibility um, because I'm, I'm, I'm also Cree. I feel a responsibility to my family, to my community. What about you, Tanya? I mean, in telling the story, that line, is a tricky one, right? Yeah. Um, well, the Globe. What did she say? Former part, journalist. Uh, former, wait, former, <laughs> former journalist. journalist. I know. <laughs> it was the Globe that referred to you as a former former journalist. journalist. I know. I know. It's probably she's your wildly successful author. They're like, she's not going to go back to journalism. <laughs> that, that, no, I think I'm sure no. that's what it was about. It's I'm like sure she's that's what yeah. it was. peons that down here. And <laughs> but do you worry right. about that? Do you right. worry that that? I mean, the the rules of engagement could be blurred um, for the best possible reasons, but. Right. That those rules were still set. No, I, I get asked that quite often now, you know, because uh, 
a bit, I am going to say two things though too. I mean, being a journalist um, is like it's almost you're more black and white though too. You've got two sides of the story. You sort of you know you go the extra mile to do all those things we've been talking about. But with the book that I wrote, it's to me it was different. I mean, it's quite clear if you read it. I have picked a side, mm -hmm. and, and I went with it. You know, and um, for many reasons that Connie was just talking about. You know, you do feel. Um, a responsibility to to tell these stories because you know um, people are coming to you because they trust you and they want the story out there and you know it is we know how to tell it in a way that's going to be I think different from some other people that don't understand as much um, to the context of all the things you were talking about with the child welfare system with um, Indian residential school with the lack of resources or, or water or you know the the in the north of the communities and just said you know, what you have to live through. Um, it's such a totally different experience. And it's so hard trying to bring that forward and explain it to people. Um, and it's, it's not easy. It's not. But um, I get asked sometimes, it's like, oh, so are you an activist? Are you a journalist activist? And actually somebody, I was just talking to someone from The Current yesterday, who we was doing mm. a pre-interview, and that's what she asked me. Oh, really? And I said to her, I said, so were you, uh, who asked you to Ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was, uh, and then we laughed about it, and she was she was really good. And she's like, no, no, she, I was just curious, because um, you know I'm asking mm. you, and you're the way you're responding to these questions. Um, but the thing is, is that you know, we're all journalists who like to tell social justice stories, and we like to tell the truth. And I think that all of us are grounded in like giving voice to people that um, that have had no voice and are not getting their stories out there. And so that's just good journalism mm. too, right? And, and that's what we're doing. Um, are we activists as a result? I, I, I don't know. Um, am I an advocate? Okay, because you know what? What's, what's going on is wrong. And how can I not say that? Are you an activist or an advocate or anything in that frame? I don't know. I'm probably trying to play both sides. You know where I, I bristle against it the most is, is with, within the advocacy community who will be like, you know, you're an activist. I'm like, I'm not an activist. I'm a journalist. But I obviously also, uh, like for example, with the Unfounded series, um, we really early on, I, when we were initially planning the story, what are some things that we could fix that would generate change? And we identified, I, you know, I, everyone I interviewed who was super smart, I asked them this question, and then I took all their answers and compiled it into a list of, you know, three basic things, which was get better stats, better training, better oversight. Better oversight, this Philadelphia model thing, I won't go into it, Google it. Um, the Globe has written like a bazillion stories about the Philadelphia model. So because we're trying to be like, hey, everybody, look over here. Look at this thing. It's working. These guys are doing it. Let's like really praise them because we're like, look how well it's working over here. Um, can I say that that's not sort of part of my mission mm. to get people, the country, thinking about having civilians look at sexual assault files? Um, Obviously, so it's that kind of funny thing. And the great thing is that half of the country is now being policed by a police service that is going to let violence against women advocates go through their police files. Um, and StatsCan is going to collect unfounded stats again so we can track them. And half of the country is being policed by a police service that is going to implement modern training and specialized sexual assault training. Um, so. Yeah, I would say I am a journalist, but uh, certainly I have done a lot of thinking and soul searching around like what I want to do with this career. And we have this really lucky, incredible platform that, of a place that's going to say like go out and do it. And I, I have decided I'd like to use it for social justice issues. So I don't know what that makes me, but yeah. well, I also think it's it's about a, <laughs> a conversation yeah. that we have about like just journalism in general about being objective and subjective and how just I think inherently in our jobs and being on social media and being more connected to the people that we're reporting on and reporting to um, is this level of transparency that hasn't existed before. And I think that, that it's like, the more transparent we can be about how you know, subjective journalism is in general, like not just us, but everyone, you know, we all are making decisions all the time about the stories we're choosing to cover, who we're choosing to interview, and those come from our personal experiences. So, you know, I, I think that, that it's kind of evolving in a way, and, and it's exciting to be part of that. A lot has changed um, since 
that initial pitch that you made was dismissed. Mm -hmm. um, you see the success of, of the podcast and what's going to come out tomorrow is amazing. Um, and then there are things that what you leave you wondering whether things have changed at all. Oh, yeah. So this is a headline that was in the Thunder Bay Chronicle Journal last week. Yeah. Um, it said, egg toss incidents have police scrambling. Mm -hmm. And this is about um, people throwing things, eggs, but a lot of other things as well, uh, at three indigenous, well, the story was largely about three indigenous people, but there's a long history of that in Thunder Bay. Um, what does that headline tell you, Connie? Well, I, I think it actually shows that things have changed because I think that people wouldn't have necessarily even batted an eye at something mm -hmm. like that, um, you know, a few years ago. And I think that the the other thing that people have been talking about in the last few weeks is the the trial in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. uh, the Gerald Stanley trial, and the death of, death of Colton Bushy, and the uh, Cormier trial, and the death of Tina Fontaine. And, and people are really upset about, um, about that. But I think that for me, um, the, the attention that both of those cases have gotten is proof of the change that's existing and proof of the conversations that are happening across the country nationally that weren't happening before. But the headline's still published in the local paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the, the Chronicle Journal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad headline. No, but, yeah, it, but, they, it, but it's still, it, it, somebody know, had to see it, other people had to see it. They were also doing, you know, uh, it's it's Thunder Bay too, right? But it's but it's not just Thunder Bay, right? It's it's like all um, communities in Canada, smaller communities. I mean, you could possibly see that. I know I'll go back a little bit too. But when we were doing MMIWG stories as well, I mean, one of the things that I was just made me sick was like we would go through um, stories from like 30, 40, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and how they would refer to Indigenous women and girls in like little tiny briefs or like barely cover them when their bodies are found or if they're if they're missing for long periods of time it was just so disgusting you know and you see it all over it time and time again um, and you know it leads right up to this coverage and this it was an acceptance in Canadian media for so long to to be this way you know to treat indigenous stories Indian stories this way and there was always a difference between those stories and our stories right it's just like it's us and them almost that is I think I hope change but in Thunder Bay it's been a bit of a longer process and there's been a history too with that newspaper in publishing um, letters to the editor um, Alvin Fiddler, the Grand Chief there, he has, you know, been sort of ripped many times on, uh, in the letters page and editorials, um, and it's not been okay. And let's people go back are standing up and saying it's not okay. Well, I was going to say, go back to what Connie said, which is about that, but about stories, you know, characterizing Tina Fontaine, headlines <laughs> saying it's, you know, the Colton Bushy trial, and it's not a trial of Colton Bushy. Does that, you're encouraged by that? You're encouraged by well, the fact, and social media, I'm, I'm trying I to be positive, for sure. I, I mean, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that those cases are getting the attention that they're getting, and they're part of national conversations, because there is a long history of, um, I think, that kind of injustice that happens within the courts, or, you know, just the interactions of Indigenous people within the justice system, um, that didn't get a lot of attention. And so uh, if I'm trying to be, I, th I think generally I'm, I'm an optimist, um, trying to think positively, I think that, okay, well, that's getting a lot more attention. Like, there was a point even when we started CBC Aboriginal in 2012, and I remember at that, it was my job at that time, because I was working on the website, to be, like on top of every indigenous story that CBC was doing, like online, on TV, on radio, network talk, uh, regional talk. And there was a point where I could, where I was like, okay, as it happens, as a story tonight. And so we were like tweeting that or trying to pull that into our lineup. And it's gotten to a point now where I couldn't keep up even if I wanted to. And I try really hard, like I'm online a lot, mm -hmm. but I can't. And I think that that is incredibly encouraging, that there is finally a recognition, these mm. are important stories, there's finally a recognition that Canadians care about them. They're, they're, and, and you see, like that's just manifesting in more and more coverage. Like this snowball is just going down the hill. And obviously things are not gonna change overnight in terms of media making mistakes and doing you know, a completely bang up job of covering every story but uh, you know I think that overall coverage is improving. Um, conscious of time and so we have uh, an opportunity for people to ask some questions if people want to go to that microphone you can do that I'm just gonna ask one more of my own and I was trying to figure out there are a couple of things one is just when you invest yourself in stories like this that are difficult stories and hard stories sort of what the toll is on you and how you kind of manage that um, but I am really interested as well in the positivity and the optimism that you have. So let's hear both quickly. If you're doing these stories and you've all been invested in them for, for a long time, how much of it do you, do you take into yourself? 
Uh, quite a bit, uh, especially in situations. The, the story that I ended up pulling, I probably became way too connected in that particular individual's life. And at one point, she was arrested. And I was her like 1 AM phone call from the police station. And I drove to court to pick her up the next day. And I was like driving there. And I'm like, I really should not be driving her home. But like, what do you do? So um, yeah, you, you really worry about it. And I think, um, I think what we do is we need to do talks like these and talk to people about how much we, this kind of weighs on our soul. Um, I don't know if there's a way around it, but I think it, at the very least it can help people be more informed about how careful journalists are uh, with these stories and how much we, we do take home. In terms of optimism, yeah. at least in my specific little corner of the world and the reporting I've done with Unfounded, um, I had a meeting this past summer with a police service. I had many meetings with police services recently uh, that had no time for me a year ago and now was like, okay, tell us what to do. And um, it, it's, yeah, I, I actually like get a little teary like thinking about it. Like I really do feel um, that there's real honest uh, desire for change. And, and it's not that they've suddenly, they're doing a PR spin, although some of them are, but it's more like it feels like there are, you know, elements within each police service in the country that were trying to make these changes and were being told by people like, no, or, oh my God, like rolling their eyes at them. And then they could take the story and go to their boss and say, now's the time and I want to do it. And I'm meeting all of those officers now and it's really inspiring and I feel very optimistic about this one particular corner. Tanya, in doing the book, um, did you have to separate yourself at all? Did you did it you know follow you into your life? How difficult? Oh yeah, you yeah. live it. Yeah. You know when you're you're doing a book like that, it's or were you writing a book? I mean, it's constantly with you. The stories were with me for years before I actually sat down in true journalist fashion too. <laughs> you know, after thinking about it for a really long time, finally sitting down and writing it. Um, so it, it stays with you. It's, it's not easy. Um, I have, I guess, I can answer it in a number of ways. I'm lucky that um, um, I keep a relationship with everyone that I, I've written about. Um, we, we talk, you know, um, some families more than others, and also, too, with um, the community. Um, I, you know, everyone texts each other. That's a great thing about, you know, Facebook Messenger um, and uh, texting. You're just like, hey, how are you doing? Did you hear about this? Just every few days or, you know, every few weeks or something. And it's, it actually, it's lovely. It's like a basket. It's like, you know, we're all sort of here in this together. And that's the beautiful thing, I think. Um, and, uh, it just, um, there is hope, you know, there is, there has to be hope. Otherwise, it would just be really just so dire. Um, and I, with me, um, I've been shocked to see how many teachers and educators have really taken up the book. Um, really, it's quite amazing. And it's, I'm hoping, leading to something. I mean, in Thunder Bay right now, the Ontario Ministry of Education, who forever has just said, you know, there's always been these silos, especially when it comes to education. Well, that's not our responsibility. That's a federal responsibility. Those are, you know, federal schools. I think that that's changing quite a bit now. I mean, now the, the boards are all sitting down and it's like, okay, this, this is a situation. How can we make this better? Yeah. I've actually given talks to senior Ontario Ministry bureaucrats and they, they've asked, you know, what can we do? And we want to change things um, in Thunder Bay. And so there is a movement to get all the boards talking and to do things with the students. And that is so important because you, you know, you, you, we have to stop looking at things like, well, that's, that's, that's federal, that's not our responsibility, or that school across the street isn't, that's, that's, that's you know, those are, those are the Indians over there. It's like, you have to get over that. It's just like, look, if you're gonna build a community, if you're gonna actually fight racism, you start with kids, you start with schools, you get people interacting. Connor, you spent the last year working on this new podcast. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. yeah. It's been intense. It's been really intense. I, I echo everything they said about how uh, it's not something that you can shut off at five o'clock, six o'clock, or whatever time of day or weekend. Um, I feel like because uh, because I have the experience I do, and I come from the place that I come from, uh, like I feel like it's almost a relief that finally there is this attention and awareness about these stories. So because we've always cared about them and they've always been important to us and we're living and dealing with them all the time. So it's, it's in a way, it's been a bit of a relief. I think that what's happening right now in journalism, I hope, is that even over the last year, there has been just m more conversations about the role of trauma in journalism and how journalists deal with covering these difficult stories. And I think that 
you know, there's maybe been more education or awareness around foreign correspondents who do that kind of work and to encounter those situations. But I think that there needs to be even more conversation about people who are working domestically and people who are working in Canada and, and covering these stories because, you know, they do take a big toll and it is very taxing. And it's important work and I'm so glad and grateful to be given the space and time and resources to do it. But um, but but I but I think that there you know there need to be conversations about support and and dealing with that kind of trauma. We have time for a couple of questions. If anybody has one, um, we ask you to go to the microphone so that we can all hear you. Uh, and if you have a question for a specific member of the panel, off you go. Hi. Hi, my name is Manika. I just wanted to say thank you to all three of you as well for having this very interesting and important conversation today. Uh, my question is for Connie. Um, Connie, you were talking earlier about how digital and social media has really changed the way that... I was just going to tweet right now. That's why I had my phone <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Perfect, perfect <laughs> timing, perfect timing. Uh, how it's really changed your audience and your reach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering about the choice of the podcast, because this, this is how you chose to tell Alberta's story, now Cleo's story. And so, um, you know, why, why the choice of the podcast? And also, how did it allow you, I think, to tell their story uh, in a way that maybe a TV documentary didn't, or even a long-form piece of written journalism, journalism rather. How was that different? I think a great it's, question. Yeah, I think I think it's fantastic. I think the podcast is really the perfect way to tell uh, MMIWG stories because, uh, you know, I think that there's this first of all interest in true crime right now that just seems insatiable in, in terms of for podcasting especially. Um, but I think our goal in all of our reporting on MMIWG has been to focus on more than just whatever the violent act was that, that ended up resulting in a death or a disappearance, but to try to show just how every woman is from a community and a family that loves and misses them, and also try to show how this issue is interconnected with all indigenous issues, like residential schools and 60 Scoop or child welfare or colonization or systemic racism or you know even things like housing, water quality. And I think that the podcast is just, it gives you, it's like there's actually a platform where people are willing to put headphones in their ears for like half an hour, 45 minutes. It's like, if you're in line, you're like, you're trying to get somebody to, to watch your video for 30 seconds. 45 seconds, a minute? It can't be longer than a minute. Like, if it's online, mm. if it's on Facebook, they're not going to listen for more than a minute. Mm -hmm. If you're scrolling on a newspaper article, like, those numbers, those stats are scary, right? Like, how how many seconds somebody will look? Or, I mean, if it's a long-form investigation, people people actually, there seems to be an appetite that for, for, like for that minutes. as well. For, like, eight minutes. But still, like, that's pretty impressive for online. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so just that there's this growing audience who's willing to do that and be invested in these stories. And I think that the great thing about a podcast is that it also allows you to be more personable. Like, like I actually, the Alberta Williams story felt like it was also part of my story and why, you know, getting into why I became a journalist and why I want to make those connections, why I want to connect the dots for people back to this thing. So I love I love that. I love podcasts. I have to write a television script next week, and I'm like, I can't even remember how to do mm. that. I don't know. It's like, it's only 14 minutes? That's not going to be long enough. I hope that answers your question. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, my name is Gordon Fraser. I'm from the Ravina Project, and you've all done um, public speaking, and you probably have to. I do it. Problem is, at the end of your presentation, somebody gets up, makes a two-minute statement, sits down, and everything they say is wrong. So tell me how you deal with it. Wow. Um, I <laughs> roll my <laughs> eyes and leave. I don't, uh, I'm, I, maybe I'm not sure I understand your qu question, but like you mean like they've, I've, I've spoken and then at the end they've missed my point? No, they actually in their statement give you demonstratively demonstrably oh. wrong wrong information. Well, I mean, I think, you know what, I think uh, social media is a great force of good. And I think when we, when we talk about MMIW, when we talk about sex assault, when we talk about um, Black Lives Matter, I don't know more, like we're getting traction in a lot of these areas because of social media. And I think that that's the good side of it. And the bad side of it is we are, you know, there's confirmation bias. We're all reading within our silos. No one can figure out algorithms to, People like, are shouting at each to other. cross in. Yeah, yeah. and um, I think that that is, that is part of the reality of, of life in this generation. And it is our, it's the biggest 
threat to humanity right now besides global warming maybe so um, we have to figure I don't know if there's a solution to it uh, you know they say you know it's important to sit and talk to one other and listen and um, it's really actually hard to speak to somebody who does not want to listen and I'm saying that as someone if someone's trying to convince me of something that I think is absolutely contrary to the way that I view the world I'm you're not going to convince me uh, you know that uh, same-sex couples shouldn't be able to get married so it, it's it, it's a very challenge I don't know the solution to mm. that that's where I went with roll my eyes but yeah Fair pull enough. it apart yeah. figure out the facts what's real what's not like dissect what they're saying and just say no 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 it's like fake news no thanks for your question thank you <laughs> thanks a couple more if we have uh, Sure. Hi. Hi, my name is Rick Spence. I write a business column for the National Post. Thank you guys for being here and for all the incredible work you've done. Wondering if you can tell us what the most exciting thing is you see yourselves working on now, if you can tell us. Ooh. And, mm. uh, <laughs> Sneak previews. And uh, also, is there a story out there that you wish somebody else would do, an untold, another untold story you'd like to see somebody else pick up on? Two yeah. Who wants to go first? I, I've started doing something now that I'm really excited about that I'm not telling anybody because I don't want come you all on, to steal on. it. <laughs> and uh, can you hint? Yeah, but like it's it's the to me it's this again it's this uh, don't I steal have this it. platform so what can I use for it and what am I really interested in and uh, I am I'm interested in social justice issues, so I'm doing something like that. Like, that was nice and vague. vague as, you. As, as mysterious Thank as you. it could possibly yeah. be. Yeah. 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 Um, are you going to answer the second part? What was the second part? Which second was a part story was... that uh, you oh, want someone to tell. I think there is, we need to figure out a way, uh, Canadian media, media at large, to write about global warming. Um, and to make people care about it. People do care about it, but the problem is you it's so dire if you actually write the facts as they are that it's kind of like, I'm choosing to not have a heart attack right now and an anxiety attack, so I need to not read that. And uh, there needs like a, an accessible way into this somehow. And I don't know if it's a, it's a money story mm. or it's like what companies are benefiting. Um, or where, like, where the lobby interested is, I don't know. And at, at, the challenge in Canada is we're kind of like small bit players. So is it really worth putting in a ton of investment in when we're, we're kind of open to it in any way? Anyway, I, that's, that, that's where to me is, and, and I'm saying that as someone who I could be the person to do that story. I'm obviously in a position to do it, but I can't figure out what it is, what the in is to make that a digestible, readable thing that could actually change something. Neat. Um, I'm on the Atkinson Fellowship right now, and uh, so I can, I can tell you what I'm doing because it's actually, <laughs> it's, I've seen it in the newspaper. Um, I'm writing about uh, suicide in um, Indigenous communities throughout Canada and also globally looking for patterns, um, but I'm looking for a path forward. I don't want to tell the story that, um, that we all know and we see, and sometimes I think people get hard to the headlines and to the statistics that they see. Um, I, I want to go beyond that and say, okay, how do we how do we make change? And that's the the beautiful thing about the Atkinson Fellowship is that it's that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to look at um, an issue and create change. Like, how can we make this better? Um, so it's it's a bit of a different vehicle, and I'm really excited about that. And I swear I'm going to finish it soon. <laughs> <laughs> what would you want to? What would you? What's the story that you want someone? See, you to didn't tell? answer the second question. I know. Yeah. I was you didn't notice that. It's tricky. Um, it is a tricky one. Oh, that's so hard. There's so many things. You know, I think you're right with climate change. That's that's very true. But it's um, bigger stories on people. I like. I'm like old fashioned. I like. I like profile stories on people. I like people in the city. And I know everyone's going to say, oh, we do lots of that. Um, but I, I, that's, those are the stories I like to read. I like to read about um, urban indigenous issues. I don't think that gets a lot of coverage. And I think that we need to really drill down. You know, And I feel guilty about that, too, because I often, too, write about what I know. And what I know isn't in the 416 or 905. It's, it's north, it's west. Mm -hmm. It goes in a different way. But you know, and, and I often feel. Um, guilty too is like oh I should be doing more like you know uh, I should be on top of all these things mm -hmm. and, and I think what's happening around us is something that we're not we're not doing we're not seeing. Connie, 
Well, actually, I have a podcast launching tomorrow, and that's what I've been working on for the last year. Um, so everyone can go to cbc.ca uh, slash finding Cleo. Actually, just between us, um, it's out tonight. They, they released it a little bit early mm -hmm. for anyone who wants to, to listen. Um, so I've been working on that for the last year. I've been... Um, yeah, working really hard on it, so I, I hope Cleo? people... Cleo was a young Cree girl from Saskatchewan who was apprehended during the 60s scoop, actually in the 70s, uh, and adopted into a white family. And a couple of years after she was adopted, her family got word that she had been killed, that she was trying to hitchhike back home to Saskatchewan, and she was murdered. Um, but that's all they've ever known about what happened to her. And it's been 40 years, and now her siblings, who were also all apprehended and adopted into white families, have reconnected and have joined together to try to find their sister. So they've asked us for help, so we're trying to help them find, find Cleo. And it's an incredible story, um, just, yeah, heartbreaking. So don't maybe binge it all at once, but um, <laughs> that's good. And as for other stories, I mean, I'll be looking for a new story coming up. So if you guys have any ideas for me, let me know. I don't know that that totally answers the question, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. That's great. Um, we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Andre from HuffPost Canada. Um, I know the answer is to hire more Indigenous reporters. Um, until that happens, what is your advice to younger reporters who are very keen um, to tell more Indigenous stories, but maybe reluctant because they're not Indigenous themselves? I think they just do it, like, but, but do it with, try to do it with a sensitivity. Um, Duncan McHugh has a guide yeah. uh, called Reporting in Indigenous Communities that is really just kind of a, a primer for people who maybe have never even been to a community before, whether it's urban or rural. Um, it's riic.ca. I think that's that's fantastic. Um, I what are, would you, like off the top of your head, do you know like, what, some of the things that he has in that guide? I mean, one of the I, things is about time. Yeah, exactly. Right? And I think like we, we talked about that just about giving giving people space to in order to establish trust to remember these are marginalized communities that haven't gotten any attention and they're probably wary of you talking about them and their community so giving them the space to to do that you're not necessarily going to be looking for 30 second clips you know mm -hmm. for the podcast we did interviews that were hours long you know I, I not necessarily everyone has to do that but um, I think that that um, that trying to approach things uh, with a sensitivity and an understanding, trying to, to learn as much as you, you can about how interconnected all these issues are and connecting the dots back to whatever it is you're covering and uh, residential schools and 60 Scoop and colonization and racism and, and really being aware of how interconnected all of those things are, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And being respectful, like what I was saying earlier about being a story taker, make sure you're not that way, you know, you don't have a list of, um, like I, how I was with Stan, you know, just like bang, bang, bang. These are the, the questions I have, and this is what I want answered. Um, you know, it's it's not good journalism too to to start interviews like that and say, okay, this is what I'm looking for, because um, you're not really going to get a good story, right? You're not going to get um, a measure of the person you're talking to. It's good to sort of sit down and have a conversation with them. And sometimes a good story takes more than one conversation. Sometimes it takes a few conversations. Sometimes it takes years, <laughs> you know. Um, so you just have to go with it and use your instinct that way and um, and be respectful. And I would echo what you said about Duncan McHugh's guide. It's fantastic. And it's really, it's short and it's easy and it's amazing. You're all awesome. Thank you very much. You're awesome. Thank you. You're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm executive director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. And on behalf of the CJF and the entire audience, I'd like to thank our extraordinary panel for sharing their insights into what makes a good story and for giving us a rare window into another story that speaks to the importance of rigorous journalism and the work they do every day. The passion, the curiosity, the tenacity, the use of great storytelling to affect change and to make audiences care about the journalism that matters. It has been an honor to have you on our stage this evening. Thank you for being here. And uh, our thanks to Matt Galloway for leading this discussion. Every morning, Matt brings us important stories and tough journalism from every corner of our city, and he brings so much to this discussion, especially after an 18-hour day. So uh, we're so grateful uh, for the work, Matt, you put into leading this discussion this evening. Please join me in a round of applause for Matt Galloway.
We hope you'll join us for our upcoming J Talks. We're doing a deep dive into some interesting issues in the digital age, like how much should we be able to edit or erase from our digital pasts. On April 4th, we're hosting a half-day summit on the right to be forgotten. The event features experts on both sides of the debate, including Michael Geist and Amanda Maltby. And on May 2nd, in the age of misinformation, disinformation, AI, and media manipulation, we explore how news organizations and platforms like Google are building trust with audience. The discussion is hosted by Anna Maria Tremonti. And on May 24th, we partner with RTDNA for a timely and important talk with Lara uh, Satrakian on fixing news and newsroom cultures. Satrakian was among the five women who shared their accounts of sexual harassment by political journalist Mark Halperin while he was at ABC News. And finally, our thanks to Ron and to TD uh, for giving us a stage tonight to highlight the importance of vibrant journalism in our country. We're grateful for your support. And thanks to all of you for supporting the work of the CJF. It's my pleasure to invite you to stay and meet our panel, continue this conversation, and enjoy this spectacular view at the cocktail reception in the room next door. Thank you so much. <laughs>